Um, okay, so uh, the title of this panel is um, is uh, Unconventional Story Formats. Lists, tests, emails, journal entries, there are lots of ways to remember the important events in life. Some of these mundane methods can be used to create fantastic tales. Um, my name is David D. Levine. Uh, I'm a science fiction and fantasy author. Uh, I have won a Hugo and a Nebula Award. I've published over 50 short stories and three novels. Um, and I will have the other participants introduce themselves, uh, beginning with, uh, with Mary. Hi, I'm Mary Soon Lee. Um, I write science fiction and fantasy, and I guess my most recent book is somewhat unconventional in its format. It's an epic fantasy, 97,000 words long, but it's told in poems, so instead of regular prose. 97,000 words of poems. Yes. In but it's not, it's not all one poem. No, and they're not all in the same style. A few of them even rhyme, but most don't. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll look forward to hearing more about that. Uh, Martha, you're next on my screen. Hi, I'm Martha Wells. Um, I'm a writer. I've done the Murderbot Diaries most recently, the books of the Raxura, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, I've won a couple of Yugos and a Nebula, and um, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. And Osahan. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Osahan. I am a writer of um, speculative fiction. Um, I have published some short stories in um, Clark's World and um, Strange Horizons. And um, yeah, that's about it as well. Okay, cool. Um, so big topic. Um, I'm going to start by asking everyone um, if, they have, uh, if they have written and or published anything uh, in a non-conventional format. So, uh, so Mary, you, you can start by talking some more about your, uh, about your novel and poetry. Well, I think I'll say first of all, I did not mean to do it. I wrote a poem, um, which was meant to be just one poem, but then, you know, the next day or a couple of days later, I wrote another poem that was about the same character. And somehow I found myself writing hundreds of them. <laughs> and then at the end, there were 340 of them and I'd come to the end of this epic story. And it was, it was immensely fun to do. And it was funny because I was able to write it jumping around backwards and forwards in a way that I think would have been hard if it had been just prose. So as a, from the writing point of view, it was very convenient. I was trying to squeeze everything into the slots when my children were at school and I could do a poem and have it be sort of complete to itself during a school day and then not think about it too much. I did think about it, but not as much as I would normally overnight. Um, so, so it was convenient. <laughs> and I, since then I've written, um, I write short stories and some of those are in, I guess, what you would call unconventional formats, but I'd like to hear from Osahan and Martha and Ju. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, Martha, you're next on my screen. I've done a little bit um, most recently <clears throat> excuse me, in network effect, when Murderbot is not, um, since it's a novel and there's more, uh, there's some more POVs than just Murderbot, um, I've used transcripts mm -hmm. where it will actually just have the, the character name and what they said. And this is Murderbot's transcript of what was said or, or whichever, um, whichever uh, character. So using transcripts to report on conversations that were happened in the past using transcripts for um confusing conversations when there's when it's one um artificial entity trying to listen to a bunch of humans at one time um and that was really cool and that um it kind of simplified um something that could have been a fairly big scene uh from the pov of a character who had just met the rest of these characters and kept it moving during long action sequences. So that was really interesting. I'm glad I thought of doing that. I hadn't um, 
Um, I'd never done that before. And also, I think I did some, um, some flashbacks in unusual formats through that book. Okay, thank you. Um, and Osahan, have you, have you published anything in an unconventional format or alternatively, have you read anything interesting? Um, yeah, I have published, I think my two stories in Clark's World are in unconventional formats. Um, Say It Low Then Loud, which was in um, the January 2018 issue of Clark's World, is told like, I think entirely in like math equations and like um, math kind of questions. So um, that was something I think I played around with, which is um, very fun. Um, because the main character was a mathematician and I kind of wanted to um, get in his head a little bit. Um, and I think um, the other story that I published in Clark's World, um, which was in the July 2018 issue, that was called um, For What Are Delusions, If Not Dreams. Um, that was also, um, it had like little snippets, quotes of like different people in the world. So it was told in like a mixture of like um, TV recordings and like um, just like interview questions and um, stuff like that. And um, also, I have a story forthcoming from the dark, which is called Forward That As Received. And it takes place on a WhatsApp group chat. So um, like interspersed in the um, story are like little chain messages. Um, so that's what I've done so far. Cool, cool, very cool. Um, and uh, as for myself, I've been racking my brain and. I don't think I've act I don't think I've actually published anything in an unconventional format, uh, but uh, one of my favorite stories that I've ever read was uh, the first published story of Charlie Finlay, who is now the editor of FNSF, called Footnotes, and it is indeed a story told entirely in footnotes. It is it is all of the footnotes and only the footnotes of a scientific paper describing a uh, describing I believe it was a uh, a, vi a virus outbreak. Um, and so the story is told entirely through the footnotes. I also read one years ago, and I don't remember the author or title, where the story was a review of the opera based on the historical incident, which was what the story was actually about. Although, of course, any story told in that kind of format is about multiple levels simultaneously. Um, there's a lot of... Um, Dracula is one of the more famous um, expository novels, a novel written in the form of uh, correspondence. Uh, I believe that Jane Austen's first books were, were, written, were written as expository novels, um, and she became less expository as her career went on. As a matter of fact, I think that her first novel actually began as a, as a fictional exchange of, of uh, letters between her and her sister. Um, and so the expository novel is a well-known uh, is a well-known form, and it bringing that forward into WhatsApp chats and text chats and and tra and court transcripts and things like that is an obvious extension. Um, so, what do they? You know, what do these forms bring to the table? Um, and any of you can can uh, stick up a hand. I don't know when I've seen it Why done. You hmm? I've seen it done in. Why uh, you What? Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted. Um, I've seen it done a lot in fan fiction, particularly as telling stories through text, um, which can be very cool because you can get in a, a very complex interaction between a lot of characters. Um, you can take um, shows or material that are, are fantasy and convert them into modern day that way. Um, I've just seen a lot of really neat things done with it as text, uh, text messages, I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, yeah. a regular <laughs> novel will have chunks, a bit like network effect, that are something else like a transcript or at the beginning of the chapter there'll be, it used to be quite common to have fake encyclopedia entries or yeah. ads or something placed at the beginning of chapters to just sort of give another flavor. It's, um, and the, the ones where they're written in letters or something, you can sustain through a whole thing, but some things are difficult to do for 400 pages. Yeah. <laughs> like a list, you can, um, you, have, you can find short stories that are lists or something, but it would be hard to do a list that was your entire novel and have it work. 
Yeah, that would be really avant-garde, I think. That would be <laughs> would be unusual. It would be neat to see someone do it and pull it off. I yes. don't think I would be that person who could do it. Yeah. And I, I remember the um, Charlie Finlay um, story that you were mentioning. Oh, Charles Coleman Finlay, I guess is his publishing name. And there was, it reminded Sorry, me, yes. I read another one um, in Fireside Magazine more recently, I think it's 2018, by Sarah Gailey, which was Stet, which was also, a lot of it was um, in the footnotes. Yeah. yeah, it was quite well done. Yeah, that was in the form of a dialogue between the, basically between the story and the copy editor. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Stet was amazing. That was at least at least a Nebula nominee and possibly a winner, I don't recall at this point. Yeah, I think I- uh, Also, huh? Oh, sorry. Hmm. Oh, no, yeah, I was going to say it was, it was a nominee. Yeah. yeah, I think it was. <laughs> one, thing that, one thing that I think we can say is that um, inserting text chats into an otherwise conventionally structured story is basically just dialogue. You know, that, that you use dialogue or exposition um, in, in some kind of mix. Um, in order to achieve certain effects, because dialogue is in some ways very immediate and in some ways very slow. Uh, because when you're actually transcribing the words that come out of people's mouth, there's a lot of noise um, that that means that means that you can't get as much information per page when mm -hmm. you have characters talking to each other as you can if you just go in there and state it in a in a paragraph. Um, and this is why a lot of um, a lot of beginning writers will have uh, will have dialogue between two characters explaining something that the audience needs to know. Uh, this is sometimes recalled made in Butler dialogue, uh, mm. where two characters are telling each other something they fundamentally both already know. And not only is it clunky and not only is it overused, it's also really inefficient. If mm. you need to, I, I'm a firm believer in the power of exposition. I think, I think if you have something to say, you should be able to just say it, but, uh, but it has to be done uh, with care. Um, so, so we can, so these, these forms can be mixed. You can dump a text chat or, or, a, or a shopping list or something into a conventionally structured story. Uh, but what are some really radical structures, uh, not just use of other forms of communication, but actually completely different ways of structuring a piece of fiction? Well, at the low end, there's the sort of choose your own adventure books where you get to the bottom of the page and you, the reader chooses which page to go to. I, I don't think that's um, particularly excellent, but um, it is a radically different structure. <laughs> there's not one narrative. Um, um, one of my... Yeah. Um, favorite um, horror stories is um, called Descent by um, Carmen Maria Machado and I think it appeared in um, Nightmare and um, what I really like about it and what I think it's so um, radical about it is the way it's structured is basically told as um, a series of like um, stories told at a book club so it goes from what someone said to what someone else said to what someone else said and it, it goes further and further into that to basically portray um, a school shooting. And it, I just thought it was so, so, so powerful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Jane Austen Book Club, uh, which is not a science fiction book, but it's by a science fiction author. Uh, she's one of the founders of the Tip Tree Award and her name is slipping my, slipping my mind at the moment. Um, but- Karen Joy Fowler? Anyway. Is it Karen, Karen Joy Fowler? Yeah, Karen Joy Fowler, uh, the Jane Austen Book Club is told from the first person plural perspective of the book club. Um, so, so the book club is, is, the, is the point of view character, is, is we. Um, and it's a story of a book club, but it's also mostly about, it's, it's, a, it's a story that is told as a series of book club meetings. Um, oh, and I had another one just a moment ago. Um, Uh, something agenesis of gender ideation. Atypical agenesis of gender ideation, I believe is the title. I 
think it might be Ted Chang. I'm not sure about that, but that is told in the form of a scientific paper mm -hmm. um, with a little bit of with a little bit of exchange uh, between the between the writer and the, between between the author of the paper and the reader at the end. Uh, but that one's really powerful. It is and it is a way of presenting an extremely complicated concept in a way that is introductory uh, because it's a, it's a scientific paper written for a general audience. Uh, so that allows the writer uh, to just put information out there for the reader rather than having to find a way to dramatize it. Karen Lord did something really uh, interesting with her most recent book, Unraveling. It's, I think it's set near, near future, with, but it's, it has fantasy elements in it. It's basically a serial killer has been captured and, um, you know, the lawyers are, 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 are certain that this is the person who committed these murders and the supernatural beings that are associated with, uh, there's something that the, the killer did to us that was involving rituals that kind of invoked them. They come in and they do these little pocket universes and bring in people who were involved with the killings and put them in these pocket universes to have them reenact these, these incidents so they can try to figure out the truth. And I thought that was a really, really interesting way of storytelling is going back over it and kind of changing, almost changing the time of what happened and changing the events to kind of a way to get the truth. That was a really, really interesting book. It's a very unconventional um, way to tell a mystery, not straightforward at all. Yeah. Um, does, is there a Rashomon element to that one? Excuse me, please repeat that. Rash, is there a Rashomon element to that one? Uh, questions about who te who's telling the truth and, and different perceptions of the truth? Very much so. Um, and the, the supernatural beings are kind of examining their own biases and how much they affected things with, without knowing it and how much they, their, their manifestations in other dimensions basically affected these events. It's just really, really interesting book. Cool. You will look that one up. Your mention of the one that was written as an academic paper um, reminds me, it has some of the same flavor, um, an Ursula Le Guin short story, the author of the Acacia Seeds and other extracts from the journal Oh, I've wrote this down of the Association of Ferro Linguistics. And it's got that feel of being um, sort of an academic presentation. But, you know, the, the, the seeds, for instance, are just like a few words by this insect. And um, it, it's, it's very effective, at least it made a big impression on me. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, these, these are the stories that do tend to stick in your head. Um, and I think if you're writing a story like this, you're, you're definitely taking a risk uh, because this going outside of the mainstream means that your chance of the story never seeing print is really high. But if you can, if you can nail the dismount, you know, if you, if you can pull, if you can pull this trick off, um, then uh, especially if you can be the first person to pull a particular version of the trick off, um, then, then your name goes in the history books. Um, so uh, I am. I'm seeing some. I'm seeing some questions in the Q and A. Um, Margaret Davis asks, "Could Osahan tell us more about using equations to tell the story?" I'm very interested in that one myself. Okay, so um, "Say It Low Then Loud" was about a mathematician who was caught in um, a war um, in space that is basically universally frowned upon by uh, most minorities because the um, mass Wheeler war is very colonialist, imperialist and such. And um, so the way um, Say It Low Then Loud was, was structured was that um, in some certain situations and some certain parts of the story, um, I just um, swapped out like words for like um, math equations. So like rather than saying less than, I just used the, the symbols um, mm -hmm. or rather than um, like talking about um, something in a particular way, I just described it as a math reference or um, like, for example, um, there's a scene um, in the story in which basically he's talking um, about like he's grappling with the fact that he's participating in this war that has kind of alienated him from his culture and his people and his family members. And I basically use that to describe um, 
the um thing in maths about like a constant and um like how that works um and like how he's how a constant basically is just not consistent with what his values are currently so his values are represented in like equations like equals to or like um less than or like more than and essentially he's just grappling with those he's using them as like meth- metaphors for his life and for his um his struggle mm. i don't know so, so the well, the theme, so it sounds like the theme of the story and the way it was presented were really closely tied together. Yes. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, did, you, did you run into any difficulties getting that one published? Like, was any of the mathematical notation difficult to, to get through to the reader? I mean, I mean, through the process of publication all the way to the reader's screen? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I... I, I mean, to answer the first question, I actually, no, I actually was one of those stories that actually sold on the first um, submission, which is very surprising. Um, but no, I don't think um, it had any problem getting true to the reader. Like most of um, the um, feedback I got um, or most of like the reaction I got seemed like it mostly translated true, which is um, very positive. Good. Yeah, I know uh, many people who have done self-publishing, if there's any kind of peculiar formatting and, and the, the, the bar for what is considered peculiar formatting is really low for eBooks because eBook, e- e-book formatting is, extre- is extremely primitive. So if you want something as, uh, something as simple as a picture, as a, as a section separator, uh, what they call a dingbat, um, mm-hmm. that doing that in an ebook is actually surprisingly difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that your story was able to be typeset without causing any serious problems. Mm-hmm. I've run into, uh, I've seen equations in fiction, I've seen music in fiction, uh, I've seen diagrams. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I was a typesetter back in the, you know, back in the dawn of time, and we called mathematics penalty copy um, because it was so hard to get right. And you needed to, you needed to have special, you needed to have specialist information in order to even proofread it. Um, okay. Any other, uh, any other adventures in typesetting that people can, I, I see there's a couple of questions in the Q&A that are relevant to this, but, but I'm interested to hear what the panel might have run into. Or seen. I haven't uh, I don't think I've had any problems. I had a minor problem with having written something in script format that turned out exactly that to be hard to be put into an electronic format successfully. And we ended up just putting the name of who's speaking above the paragraph of their text rather than trying to do it sort of on the left hand side of the speech, which was trickier for the person formatting. It. I, but I mean, mm-hmm. it's just a very minor thing, but it, the electronic thing didn't support it well. Um, I also have, um, I also had um, difficulty um, with typesetting, or rather um, my publisher, I think, had difficulty with typesetting um, a story that I have um, coming out, um, um, I think in November. Um, it's told, it has like a series of strike truths to it, um, mm-hmm. through it. And um, I was, yeah, it was told that it would like be difficult for that to translate in like ebook versions because um, that doesn't, that wouldn't like translate properly. So we had to like find a different way to portray the strike truths in the story. And then we decided like making them a smaller font would actually, Ooh. would actually achieve the same effect. So it was mm-hmm. like an interesting problem to solve. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and actually one of the questions in the Q&A is, uh, can you address the use of strange text layouts or graphics in a book? I'm thinking of Paul's Gateway, Walter John Williams' Aristoi, or Kaufman and Christoph's Illumini. Um, and to that, to that question from the q and I can add um, uh, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright, uh, which was, which, that, was uh, that, that was its UK title uh, by Alfred Bester. Um, man, I can remember the books. I can't remember the titles. Um, uh, to uh, the stars, my destination by Alfred Bester has some peculiar spelling and occasional graphics embedded in the text, um, and that I have I have occasionally seen ebooks which are not always uh, which are not always done by people who really care. I've seen ebooks where that sort of stuff just vanishes. Um, yeah. uh, in particular, 
even even very simple things like so many of my own short stories uh, i used to use non-breaking hyphens uh, mm. to make sure that if a if a hyphenated word fell near the end of a line that it wouldn't break at mm. the at the hyphen um, and those non-breaking hyphens just vanished sometimes. And so I'd, I'd get back, I'd get back the, the, the copy edits for a story and all of my hyphens had vanished and I have to mm -hmm. go back and put them in by hand. Um, any, other, any other issues uh, that you have seen, experienced, or could imagine around peculiar text layouts or graphics uh, in stories? I think eBooks are just really fraught for things like that. Even just a conventional map at the beginning you know, usually, I mean, you can't make it bigger. So you're like, I'm trying to look at this, you know, the tiny thing you're trying to see, and it will be broken in half and put on two pages and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think that unless we get more specialized software, uh, unconventional formats or formatting in eBooks is just really kind of difficult right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I mean, I think even ellipses as something as yeah. simple as that can be a problem in an ebook yeah yeah or if you're using uh non any non ascii character mm -hmm. you know like like a like a sigma or yeah. or yeah. or uh yeah or even um yeah yeah absolutely Sorry. um and uh Osahan, you look like you might be getting ready to say something, or am I am I am I misinterpreting your facial expression? Uh, no, 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 no. You're. I think you're misinterpreting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, and also, also, you know, I'm. I've got the. I've got the Q and A parked in the middle of my screen, so I have to kind of. I have to kind of look look around it to see your faces. <laughs> um, so here's. Okay, uh, actually, this is a related question. What unique challenges do multimedia works have when being recorded for audio? Um, so, so all of the things that we've just discussed as being a problem in eBooks are possibly even worse on audio. And audio has its own problems. Has anybody uh, run into any of those either in, in anything that you've written or anything that you've seen or heard? I hadn't thought about that. Translating like, you know, um, like Osahan was talking about the, his math story, trying to translate that into audio. That would have been really interesting <laughs> to see someone try to do that. Yes. Yes, because yeah. you'd say less than, and it wouldn't. You wouldn't be clear that it was a symbol. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I, yeah, I think the story, that story, could still work if you just read it, but it wouldn't have the same impact. Yeah. Um, I had a um, my my Hugo winning story, uh, tick tick tick, um, takes place on a planet of bugs. Um, and one of the things that I did in the story was um, I had the bug language had uh, no vowels at all. Um, it was all, it was all, and, um, and so, you know, I thought that was cute. Um, and it was cute until it came to the audio. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when I read the story myself, I just read the words as though they had vowels in them. Uh, one of the, it, that one's actually been recorded uh, two or three times. And one of them, what they chose to do was they read the words as though they had vowels in them and then went back and very carefully cut the vowel sounds out. Um, but some of these things work better on the page. Yeah. Uh, in my Arabella books, uh, the Martian language has a k sound, a k, which is written as a kh, but is not pronounced like the English k or, or is not, basically most, most English speakers pronounce it as just a hard k. Um, but I didn't actually, you, you know, I didn't actually think about the problem of the audiobook. And honestly, I haven't listened to the audiobooks uh, for that particular detail, so I don't know what they did about it. Uh, but there are a few cases where uh, a character betrays the fact that they don't really understand the Martian culture by the fact that they mispronounce the words. Any other audiobook related issues that you run into? I've never had an audiobook made of my, of anything I've done, but I have, um, you know, tried to read aloud things that I'd written that were written in script slash play format. And, you know, it's a, it's a choice. Do you actually read the names of the characters or do you try and give them different voices and skip reading the names? You know, there's no really clear answer. So you just pick one and go for it. I feel sorry for audiobook narrators sometimes because even with network effect and I wasn't using, I mean, the transcripts, I think were probably the, the, most unusual thing I did in there. But sometimes I am, you know, like going over it 
looking at it and thinking of, of Kevin R. Free who read the audiobooks and wondering, okay, how's he going to do that? <laughs> um, do you all know the story of Stephen Fry and J.K. Rowling? No. Um, when Stephen Fry was recording the first uh, Harry Potter book, um, this was before it was the enormous worldwide hit that it, that it became. Um, Stephen Fry was, you know, the big famous actor, and he runs into this. He runs into this uh, this sentence. Harry pocketed it. Harry pocketed it, and he found it difficult to say. So he went to the um, he went to the author. Went back to the author, who's this nobody, uh, and says, "Oh, could you please rewrite that sentence so I can pronounce it more easily?" And he was such a jerk about it that she said no. And not only did she say no, she made sure to use that sentence in every subsequent book. <laughs> Harry pocketed it. <laughs> okay. Um, so one of the questions in the Q&A is, what's the strangest point of view you have used in your fiction? I think that's a great question. <laughs> I... Hmm. I have had, I have used so many robots and artificial intelligences mm -hmm. as point of view. Yeah. Um, and, and I try to, I try to make them be distinct from human beings. Um, but, uh, but that doesn't, that doesn't cause, that doesn't cause as many problems as, um, as, as, uh, as, as I think some other really weird points of view. I, I had a story once. Uh, where the main character, the viewpoint character, was an alien. And I started trying to write the alien as having four eyes, two in front, two in back. And keeping that in mind and keeping it straight just proved impossible. I lopped off two of the eyes just so I could finish <laughs> writing the story. <laughs> now, I've written, uh, I mean, I have, there's Murderbot. Um, and basically all there's, I don't think there's any human POV in any of the Murderbot books. Um, so it's murder bot, you know, a sentient virus at one point, uh, uh, other AIs. Um, I've written a lot of alien characters and the Rexera books, the alien characters are shapeshifters. They go from having a kind of bee line lizard type people with wings to, um, something that's almost human looking. So keeping that in mind, um, was probably the most difficult thing is is just trying to keep that physicality in mind and think about how that would affect just how they they moved all the time and the action scenes and everything you really have to have to keep that in the forefront yeah. oh yeah keeping track of a character with a tail or more than two hands is it yeah. that's a lot of work yeah i I've done a, a, quite a lot of AIs and machine intelligences and aliens and so on. I'm not sure I've done anything really weird for point of view. I mean, I have done short things that were just an ad or something, but there's no point of view really. They're just, um, hmm. Yeah, the, the things with, uh, you know, multiple eyes and so on. I did have um, creatures which have you know, six heads and um, sort of speak in six voices and can also um, link themselves to other people. So they're seeing what the other people see or what the animal sees and controlling the creature. But there's, there's not, it was, I only showed a very limited amount from their perspective in order not to drive myself insane. <laughs> yeah, I think it would be tiring for the reader as well, I think. <laughs> Osahan, have you uh, have you either either written or read any really extraordinary points of view? Um, I have written some um, like different point of views. Um, I've written AI, um, as everyone here has. Um, I've definitely written some um, weird monsters, um, but um, nothing with too many hands or too many tails. <laughs> I mean, I think I have I have something that I am writing currently that is that has that um, is challenging to write because the monster has a lot of hands and a lot of um, body parts. Um, so that's been really fun to do. Um, I also wrote a story about um, a house um, in Stranger Horizon, so um, mm -hmm. that was really fun as well. Um, currently, um, what I'm working on, I think it's one of my most interesting POVs. It's kind of from the point of view of a sentient bubble. 
So um, mm-hmm. that's been really fun to write just because um, a bubble kind of has like no physicality about it. So it's been really fun to just like imagine um, how that would work. Cool, very cool. I imagine that a bubble's life is going to be very transient as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am remembering uh, a story called The Things uh, from about 10 years ago, um, which the, the main, the viewpoint character in this one is the creature from The Thing, uh, the John Carpenter movie. Um, and this is a creature for whom having a form you know, having a single physical form is an alien concept. Um, and so this is, this is a creature that takes, takes on the form of other things. It doesn't really have a native form. It doesn't have a single native existence. It can have multiple bodies. And it finds interacting with us, each of whom, each of us being fixed in a single physical form and not able to, not able to become someone else, um, to be extremely strange and very disquieting. Um, but it has to take on our point of view as it takes on our form. Uh, so that is a, it's conventionally structured, but it's a really interesting point of view. I highly recommend it. The things. I, I've just realized that I have to some extent used um, very odd point of views, but it's really just anthropomorphization. But um, I have a set, a book that contains haiku for the elements of the periodic table. And some of those are basically little, so here's the one for germanium. Do you miss it still, the semiconductor crown that silicon stole? So in in 17 syllables or whatever, it's kind of from the point of view of germanium or or it's talking to germanium or whatever, which is a little weird, but it's not sustained for (laughs) for page after page. (laughs) And there are quite a few like that. I have read the occasional story and seen the occasional play where it's actually in iambic pentameter and or mm-hmm. rhymed couplets, mm-hmm. but not read that way. Mm. So you have to kind of see through the presentation, either either the text on the page or hear past the presentation on the stage to notice, oh, hey, this is in pentameter. And that's so cool when it when it happens. Um, I loved I, I loved one that I read that uh, I saw I saw this one as a play actually where one of the characters was speaking in rhymed couplets except she wasn't pronouncing them as couplets. You just had to recognize that oh hey her sentences all rhyme with each other. It was like halfway through the play before I noticed this. Um, and then I saw a play um, called uh, I think it was called Charles V. It's about uh, the current Prince Charles set in the near future after he becomes king. And the really interesting thing was is that the royal characters all speak in pentameter, uh, whereas the commoners speak in blank verse. And some characters who are shifting between, uh, between they, they code shift. Um, they, they, will speak in, they will speak in pentameter or, or, in, or, in, verse, or in, in plain speech, uh, depending on who they're talking to. Uh, which which is subtle and it's kind of like it's kind of like when you're watching a tv show and the black bars come in at the top and bottom indicating that you're in kind of a a virtual reality or something like that oh man speaking speaking of non-conventional story structure this week's episode of star trek lower decks is star trek lower decks the movie i highly recommend it i loved it i think that was the best thing they've done yet and i loved every episode of that show yeah totally yeah, I, I've got a whole essay that I'm working on about the, the relative merits of, of uh, novelty and nostalgia in terms of creating entertainment. Mm. Um, but that's a whole nother panel. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see, one of the, wow, a couple of interesting, a couple of very interesting questions. I'd like to go with one that came in pretty early. Is there a distinction between story arc and story format? Which do we mean when we say story structure or both? So an epic novel and poems could still follow a traditional story structure. Um, so I, is that our, yeah, that's our 10 minute warning. So um, so I, Mary, I'll throw this one to you at least to start. Um, I got a little bit distracted by that screen, but let's see. Um, I can say that in the case- Story of, arc and story form. Um, so one thing that writing it in poems did, which was very interesting to me was, and was fun, you could take something like a major battle that in sort of a pivotal battle in the war and you could 
um, never show the main characters in that battle at all. It was very easy because you would just do the poem about this random foot soldier um, and from the, what they saw of the battle. And then afterwards, you would get some poem which told you what the king had done or whatever. But it did allow you to, um, you could zoom in on small things like there are poems from the perspective of, um, you know, very minor characters, the person who dresses the king, um, the person, you know, the cleaning woman <laughs> or whatever. And it was, it was easier to pull off, but the, it did go linearly most of the way through. It would skip over some things, like I think one of the main wars begins with a second battle and there's, you only have like a few lines at the beginning of the poem saying, oh, the first battle didn't go well, but it's completely skipped over. And then there are some pretty inconsequential things like um, time with children, which become sort of a poem in themselves and you just focus in on it. So it was, it'll, it was actually a very freeing thing to do and I'd love to do it again, but I don't think it's commercially <laughs> really viable. <laughs> I don't think I don't think it is commercially viable. But I mean, the thing about a poem is, is that is that a, sh a short poem is inherently focused, mm -hmm. and so what you get is you get something that looks more like a mosaic than a painting. Yes, a yes. collection of individual, yes. beautifully yes. realized bits, which together form a whole, rather mm -hmm. than the broad sweep. I I I I applaud you. I pl I applaud your um your your ambition in 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 doing this. Um, so, any other uh, any other thoughts on the relationship between uh, story? What do, what do we mean when we say story uh, story arc, story structure, story format? How do these relate? Um, I have I have a theory um, which which I which I could I could talk for a whole hour about this, but I, I call I call it uh, plot considered as a string of beads in four dimensions. Um, you think of if you think of each element in the story, each character, each setting, each incident as being a bead, okay, then the beads exist in a four dimensional space. They exist in, in, a, in a space in space and at a particular time. Um, so the plot is a string that goes through those beads. The plot always runs chronologically because plot is all about cause and effect. This happened because that other thing happened. So the string that, put, that connects those beads together always runs chronologically, but then the author can choose to cut that string up in bits and present it in non-chronological fashion. You can have flashbacks, you can have things going backwards, but the plot always runs forward in time, unless there's time travel, which yes, is a whole separate thing. But yes, and if yeah. you have multiple- so that's Yeah, go on. If you have multiple characters, you can also see the same point in the plot from lots of perspectives, and that's, that can be fun too. Yeah, in this in this model, that means that that the the the, the thread of the plot actually yeah. forks because it because it goes through multiple characters simultaneously. Um, okay, cool. Uh, Martha Osohon, anything else about uh, about story structure versus story arc? I think there's definitely um, unconventional story structure, and there's definitely unconventional story format. Unconventional um, story mm -hmm. structure can be um, like stories told in non chronological order, as you said, like um, non Western stories um like stories told in stories told within a story um and those can be really cool as well and i think one thing i've really found as well is that um the more complicated the story format the simpler the plot is which i think has also mm -hmm. been really interesting when exploring um the differences between structure and, pro and plot so um a lot mm -hmm. of times i see authors um do like really interesting things with like story structure and like complicated um, story structures and then i see them do like um, very complicated stuff with like story format and then like um, what they call it and then they like um, narrow down the plot so that they can like have more space to explore their ideas. That's so true. I think you'll find that that there's a kind of a uh, conservation of difficulty that if the story structure is complicated you kind of have to make the plot simpler or the reader is just going to get lost. Yeah. You know, which is you know there's nothing to stop you from doing it but it's hard to say. Yeah. Okay, um, and we've only got like five minutes. I, I, I really want to get to this question about time and memory. Time and memory are fun, but challenging to manipulate in fiction. Any thoughts on that? So we've only got five minutes. So, so let's, let's, you know, everybody tell you what, uh, can we, can we wrap up with this? Uh, talk about time and memory? 
um, as our as our closing remark. Um, so, um, Martha, why don't you why don't you go first to the last? I'm, it's really important in the Murderbot Diaries um, since Murderbot's mm -hmm. memory has been erased over and over again. Um, and it stores memory in completely different ways than the humans do. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of inability. It, it has to keep reminding itself that the humans don't have access to their entire, to everything stored in their neural tissue the way it does. Um, so yeah, those are really important points. And it does, um, it doesn't do a lot of skipping through time. Um, network effect plays a little bit with, um, with, Murderbot's concept of time in the flashbacks and also the fact that one thing I try to show is it experiences it thinks a lot faster than the humans so as these as the action scenes are going along it's having a lot of it has a lot more time to experience what's going on and check into other things while these actions are happening and trying to get that across is kind of really difficult but um, it's really worth it because I think it does give the effect of a being that's uh, operating faster than the humans around it. Cool. Uh, Mary, time and memory. Um, well, very quickly, I think sometimes it can be very effective when someone is narrating or remembering things that happened long ago. It doesn't always pull off, but um, for instance, Guy Gabriel Kay's most recent novel, A Brightness Long Ago, one of the characters um, is looking back on his youth and telling what happened during that time. And it gives it an extra layer, which I liked a lot. Cool. Uh, also, Han, time and memory. Um, I also think um, time and memory can be really cool in exploring um, unreliable narrators. Mm -hmm. um, because um, like when you're playing with the concepts of time and the concepts of memory in one character, then you're kind of like hiding away from the reader what exactly they can see in the story. And I think that is also like a really cool way of exploring it as well. Um, I think um, a story that um, um, plays with like memory or rather tr um, truths very well um, is um, The Jewel of the Vashwa in um, Apex Magazine by um, Jordan Cruella. Um, I think that's a very cool example of a story that kind of plays with like memory and like truths versus lies. Cool. Uh, and my own comment on time and memory is that one of the choices that you can make when you are writing a piece is uh, we talk about close and distant third person. So you can think about uh, your, your, you can also have close and distant first person narration. If you're writing a first person narrator, you can have that be very immediate. You can have it be, be almost, almost, you know, I mean, it's written in past tense, but it's like, it's, it's, the, it's the character's thoughts just the moment after the event has occurred. Or it could be like, like thinking back on the battle scene during the scene where you're making dinner afterwards. So it's a fairly close, but not immediate first person. Or you can have a first person, an extremely distant first person, where, as Osahan said, you're reflecting. And so what you get is you kind of get two characters in there. You get the character who's doing the action, and then there's the later version of themselves that looking back on them and go, oh, honey, I was so dumb. <laughs> yeah. uh, which the older I get, the more I find myself doing that myself. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so the great, thing about, the great thing about time and memory is that they're both extremely flexible. And you can bop back and forth almost at will. Um, so I believe we are effectively out of time. Um, thank you so much for everybody uh, who's on the panel. Uh, we, have a, we have a Discord. Uh, if for people who would like to continue the discussion, uh, there's, a, there's a Discord, which I believe uh, the link has been posted in chat. Um, I'm sorry to the people we didn't get to your Q&As. Uh, I will not be uh, at the Discord right away because I have another panel to be on uh, in 10 minutes. Um, but everybody else, uh, everybody, everybody else is welcome to continue the conversation there. Um, so thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the convention. Thank you. Thank you.